Hey everyone, um, I would first like to thank you all for your support. Thank you for all the loving words, the kindness, the prayers, and of course, just the, the fact that you guys offer your help in any way that you can help, um, that, I'm, that I'm allowed to, to turn to you for, for support, that alone soothes me and makes me feel a whole lot better in this difficult time. So thank you so much for that. And I also would like to thank David Wood and his team for their incredible support. I mean, just the fact that he shared my video on his pages. Um, and also, you know, just that you're all here, that you're here with me, that we're doing this together. That is, that means so much more to me than you can imagine. So thank you. Um, Keep posting comments, keep posting, you know, tips on what you want me to talk about, uh, and I'll see what I can do. And hopefully I'll get better at this. Uh, so, today I want to go straight into the question that, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah, there. Uh, Marcus. Marcus asked, what made you realize that Islam is a lie? Marcus, a lot of things made me realize that Islam was a lie. Uh, and it was a process of a lifetime. First, you have to understand the very nature of my abuse. It wasn't physical. Nobody beat me. But it was mental and it was emotional abuse. It was uh, from an early age in my life that I was being taught that I am not my own person. I don't have the freedom of doing what I want. Everything uh, has a social consequence. That you always have to take into account your reputation and how your family feels and thinks about certain decisions. And um, that you, you're not to question your faith. You're not to question your principles, your traditions. But you are to, you know, you're loyal or you're not. There's black or there's white. And that, you know, you were always shamed into doing things. You were shamed, you were guilt-tripped, you were, uh, you know, pretty much scared into a certain belief system. Every time you wanted to deviate from what you thought was the truth, every time you just started to question a certain value, there would be so much you know, um, people who were, went against it. It would be huge interventions, you know, you can't believe this, and, you know, it started, so it, all of this started early, and for me, my family, they had this controlling thing. They wanted to control me and, and control my the outcome of my life and make sure that I do that which is right for me according to what they think is right for me. And this sort of, you know, when you explain it that way to people from Middle East, they usually tend to think that this is a cultural thing. Oh, it's just, you know, culture. But that's the problem, is that abuse has become a culture. Abuse has become a religion, faith system. People base their whole entire beings on abuse. And I have many reasons as to why I can see how Islam and honor culture they walk hand in hand because they're both abusive, they're about control, they're about taking away your freedom and kind of pushing down the woman so that she's less worth than the man, she has less rights, you know, one woman or one man is like equivalent to two women, you know, things like that. And that you are, from an early age, you're taught to remove all of your desires that are natural as a woman, you know, your desire to be a woman and embrace what it means to be a woman. You're taught early on not to have that. And that, you know, there's something shameful and dirty about being a woman. That the more you are like a man, the more masculine you are, the more... You just... the more you kind of submit in a bad way to the man. Um, the more God will reward you, the more you cover up your beauty, the uglier you look, superficially, you know, uh, the less you care about your appearance, the better. And 
There are so many of these values that you are taught from an early age and you're brainwashed into these things. Imagine, this is not <laughs> one person. This is a family, this is a community that keeps telling you this over and over again. So what happens is you are brought up as a person who is not in control of his or her own life. And you become like this bird in a cage. I call it the bird in a cage syndrome. It's basically that your whole entire mentality, it's dependent on what other people think and feel about you and what you do. If you were to question and someday just see that you're in that cage and you would try to flee from it, you are in for so much difficulty. And you will have to have your family leave you and mistreat you. And once you've left this cage, you won't be able to fly. You know, you won't know how to coordinate yourself in society. You, don't, you won't know your rights, your laws. You won't know how the government or other people can help you in your situation. You don't know that you are in, in, in the very midst of an honor culture. You don't know that Islam is based on abuse. You don't know these things. So you are kind of, you're, you're left in the dark to a lot of these things that are obvious to everybody else. And the word honor is never even mentioned, you know, the bad honor kind of thing. It's never mentioned. And basically, that, that is sort of the background story as to why I started realizing that Islam was a lie. Because first I realized my life, the way I saw the world, the way I saw myself, it was a lie. Because I looked at myself in the mirror and I couldn't see a person. I saw a family. I saw... a community. I didn't see this. I didn't see the individual per se. I didn't see what I believed in, what I wanted from life, who I was. And when I, when this happened, in the midst of all this, you know, I call it the very, it was the very high point of the abuse. When the emotional and psychological abuse had reached this high point, this, this happened to me. And it happened you know, during this time when I was also praying a lot to God for clarity and for truth. That's when these things started happening. So it began with a prayer, it began with just being oppressed, coming from an abusive background that I wasn't aware of was abuse. That sort of triggered the, the wheels to start spinning, that something is not right here and I need to figure out what. And then I met this guy uh, that I'm still with today. Um, I thank God for that. Um, I met him and he further spinned these wheels by questioning me when I wanted to make a decision or when I said something or believed something, he would say, is this really your thought? Is this what you believe in? Is this, what is this based upon? It was always these counter, you know, questions that would appear and I would be totally taken by them. Like, what, what is all this? And I would be offended and I would go into some rant and, you know, bash him for, you know, you're, you're an awful person, you know, for telling me the obvious truth. You're terrible, terrible individual. And then slowly I became less and less sensitive. The more he offended me in a good way, the less sen sensitive I became to the truth. And I started seeing, he, he paid attention to the abuse that was going on, uh, and he started pointing them out. And I would defend them. I would defend the faith, the family, everything. I would be like, you are so wrong about this. But then the more I thought about it, I started seeing this is something I have always known and fought, but I never had the courage to do it out of the fear of what other people were going to do and say and think and also how they were going to treat me. I was afraid I wouldn't be loved if I, excuse me, if I... Um, started questioning these things, of course, because that's you, you get your love and acceptance through these conditions. If you no longer live up to the conditions, you don't get the acceptance or the love. And you're disowned from your family. So, basically, things happened in my life that were weird. I realized they were weird. The, more, the older I got, the more I wanted to make my own decisions. I started seeing how something wasn't right. I started praying to God for, for clarity, for truth. You know, God, give me your wisdom. Give me your knowledge. Show me what it is that I need to know. Give me that extra puzzle piece that's missing. And it came. It came in the form of a person who I 
um, got engaged with, uh, you know, romantically, and this person uh, helped further spin these wheels with these questions about the self and about, you know, how they were treating me. And then I started realizing and seeing that I am being guilted, you know, guilt tripped, shamed and scared into everything that I think and feel and do. And that is the root of Islam. That is the very root of it. And so I started understanding that things that were happening, it wasn't just culture, you know. No, it, it was actually based on the very foundation, the very values of Islam. If you look in the Quran, if you look in the Hadiths, there's plenty of sources, plenty of texts that show you things that I told you about now. And I can show them later on other videos, but that is the very foundation of Islam. And I started seeing this and I, and I thought, all of this is just too strange, but again, as most Muslims are, you, you, can, you can have the truth staring you right in the face and you still, you won't believe it, you won't accept it. So, further, you know, <laughs> I, I needed more. I needed to be more offended. I needed more th truth, something that would hit me hard. And uh, thankfully, I thank God for that today, it came. And those things I want to say here in this video, I'm going to mention some of them what they were. Um... Yes, okay, so <laughs> what, I, what I just described for you guys, the, the background story, what, what this eventually led, led up to was a total confusion in my faith. I didn't know how to be a Muslim. I, di I, didn't, I stopped calling myself a Muslim, actually. People would ask me what I was, I said, I, you know, I can't tell you, or I'm something di different, because the way I was practicing Islam was not according to the way Islam teaches you to practice it. Uh, I would totally uh, disregard the hadiths. I would um, proclaim them as, you know, false. I would say these are not uh, the true words of the Prophet Muhammad, so I am not going to believe them. And doing so, you are kind of stuck because you start realizing that you cannot do it alone with the Quran, even though the Quran says that you can. You start seeing that there are many details to your the way you practice the faith that is mentioned in the Hadiths, that is not mentioned in the Quran. So you start seeing that there is just not enough. There's not enough, uh, you know, proper guidance here. Everything is inconsistent. You have some verses that you know kind of, um, they tell you to do a certain prayer, but they don't tell you how. And then if you look earlier on in the book, you see that um, it says to follow the prophet uh, as your, you know, your model for how to practice your faith. And so you kind of, you're, you're left in a very awkward uh, position. That's that's what I'm trying to say here. So I I got to a point sometime before I met this guy, I got to a point where I started calling myself a Quranist. I said, I'm no longer a Muslim, I'm a Quranist. And uh, Muslims would say, you can't call yourself Quranist. I mean, you're either a Muslim or you're not. And I said, no, look, hold up. Uh, I was like, being a Muslim, a true Muslim, is not the same thing as the Islam that you know of. And they would be like, well, what are you talking about? We know the real Islam. It's the Hadiths, it's the Quran. What are you talking about? And I said, look, and I also said this to my, my boyfriend at the time, that there are two different Islams. There is false Islam and then there is true Islam. True Islam totally disregards the Hadiths. False Islam regards the Hadiths as part of the scriptures. If you are to be a true Muslim, you have to recognize the hadiths as false and you have to totally base your whole religion on the Quran. And this is really funny because you cannot do so if you don't have the details of the hadith. And 
and I would start preaching about this new Islam, the, Qur the Quranism thing. And it was totally different. They prayed differently. They had another number of prayers per day. The requirements were less. Things seemed very liberal. You were pretty much allowed to do whatever you wanted, however it suited you and however you interpreted the text. Because, guess what? It wasn't detailed enough. And so I started thinking that I was this new revolutionary Muslim called the Quranist. And that being so would mean I would be more peaceful, I would be a better Muslim, I would be a more adaptable uh, Muslim, like, how do you say it? Like, I would be more suitable f in... It would fit today's society a whole lot better. That's how I thought, if I were to be this kind of Muslim. And it was modern. It didn't have all that violence stuff. That's what I thought, at least. Um, it's inspirational, it's peaceful, and it teaches you to be strong and strive. So, just, I don't know how to explain this other than that my entire view of Islam, when I started noticing that it had so many mistakes, instead of questioning Islam, I started spinning it around a little bit, you know, creating my own spin and making my own Islam. And I would think that Quranism was the true thing. But, you you know, if you're a true Muslim, you would understand that the Quranism is an incomplete Islam and it doesn't make any sense. Really. Uh, and, um... Uh, so, I started preaching that the Quranism was a collective of the three monotheist, monotheistic religions. I thought of the way I read the Quran, the way I interpreted was that, you know what, the Quran is pretty much, um, it's a book that kind of wants to unite all these other books. Uh, and it totally removes the whole notion that there's Judaism, there's Christianity. It, re it removes this. Uh, and it wants to unify all the Abrahamic religions and call them, all of them, as one religion under God, under Abraham being the, the, the man you look up to. And that uh, we are to view Islam as sort of a collective, like a summary of, of all these religions. So that's how I, that's how I saw it. That, that was my thought. And I mean, by all means, <laughs> it was, it, it makes perfect sense. If you look in the, in the Quran and you see, you see that um, in the very beginning, that, that's how it's being taught. The very first uh, chapters, that is the message. It's the message is, is that people who say that there is Christianity and that it's not like Islam and stuff like that, you are not to pay attention to those things. Um, man, there's so many things. I get a headache just thinking about this. Um, but what happened was, I'm really trying to keep this video short, it's impossible. Uh, what happened was that this this guy that I met, he poked a hole in this theory. He said, your Quranism theory is total bull. You know, you can't hold on to this because it has so many mistakes. And I said, how? How? You have this book. It says good things about all these monotheistic religions. It unifies all of them. It says it's the one book for all of them that we are to believe in this if we truly are Christians and Jews. And that... um Somehow it's updated and it's in the better version of them. Um, that the other ones have been kind of altered over time. And that, um, well, that Islam speaks well of Jesus and, and all the other people mentioned in the Bible. It speaks really well of them. It's just that, you know, we, we are not to believe that he was crucified. This makes no sense now when I think about it because... The, the very idea, foundation of Christianity is that Jesus was crucified and that this saved us. And, you know, it, it's sort of centered around that event. 
and a lot of things in the Old Testament leads up to that. Uh, so it's really, it's funny how they totally want to disregard this. If you do that, you can, you're, you're saying pretty much the entirety of Christianity is just um, bullocks, it's, it's made up. Uh, and at the same time, as a Muslim, you are taught that you are to trust the scriptures of the Bible, that they are also part of God's book. They're this. Is, do you see how it's contradicting itself in so many ways? So th all these ideas um, kind of together made me start questioning Islam. And also having that partner who would constantly be on to me and be like, look, I can poke a hole in your theory and I, I would be very defensive and I would be totally against it and offended because he would call Islam um, a religion of, you know, Satan or, you know, this is satanic. Uh, it's uh, it's devil worship and it's not the same God of uh, that of Christianity. It's not the same. Hearing those two things really angered me because I thought I am the most peaceful person there is. I wouldn't even hurt a fly. And you're sitting here telling me that it's a religion of, of Satan. And and I'm praying to the same God you're praying to. And you're saying they're too different. And I would have to say that that was the beginning. That's the beginning of how I discovered that Islam was a lie. Was that when I made these claims, he would say... He would answer me with that they're not the same God. And there's true evidence for that if you look at how the God is represented in the Bible and how he's represented in the Quran and what he says in these different scriptures and that you may be peaceful as a person you may be peaceful and that is all always the case with Muslims that majority are peaceful the peaceful beings in society they do their thing and all that but that doesn't mean your faith is peaceful you are not your faith uh, your ideology there can be huge problems with it but as a human you can twist your ideology and turn it into something peaceful but we are to understand the law the 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 lies of islam that is the whole point here because if if your faith is a lie you cannot base your life on it no matter how peaceful you are no matter how well it suits you if it's a lie, you have to you have to leave it. It's as simple as that. So in addition to this, I'm going to give a few other things that made me feel that Islam was a lie. Um, that basically, I'm just looking through this list. Um, I already explained the abuse. Um, it was... Um, just understanding that the nature of, of, um, of Muslims were ground... it was grounded in Islam like I already mentioned to you, the bad nature of them was grounded in Islam. That it was actually Islamic uh, values. That Muslims were more prone to sitting, gossiping, bashing other religions, judging other religions. They were more prone to do this and proclaiming themselves as true followers of God and all that, you know, this whole arrogance about them. That uh, you couldn't have a normal conversation with a Muslim without having to participate in some bashing and judging. Um, they didn't un also that they didn't understand the concept of unconditional love. They didn't have that, and they denied it. In Islam, you deny that kind of uh, love. Um, and also, just all the inconsistencies, the confusion at home, what I had been through, how I had how I had been brought up. Also, that I had been um, visited in my whole life by um, demonic entities. I will talk about those in another video. It's a very, very big part of this. That also, realizing that they were of evil nature and that they weren't angels like, like Muslims would tell me that they were, 
was also part of this. Um, that every time I felt confusion in my faith, I was being shamed back into believing in it. And that my spiritual, the hauntings, the demonic hauntings and such got worse when I felt that I distanced myself from my faith. And then they got less. The hauntings became less when I went back to my faith. Very, very um, strange coincidence, in my opinion. And understanding that if, you know, <sighs> that if you cannot have a, a, a relationship with your God in prayer, it's prayer is pointless. I had always struggled with it. When, when I wanted to pray to God, I didn't feel a relationship with him. I couldn't connect with him. That instead I was trying to force some kind of um, uh, like euphoric feeling through my own emotions. Through shame, through guilt and things like that. I would try to force a feeling in prayer. But I never felt connected to God in the prayer. Because A, it was incredibly ritualistic. B, I didn't understand what I was saying. And C, there were rules on how you could talk to God. You couldn't, you couldn't talk to him the way I'm talking to you right now. That wouldn't be acceptable. It would be shameful. And the whole Quran is, Quranism notion, I already mentioned that. And also just that my... How, how my belief system so easily was annihilated pretty much by historical evidence you know, archaeological evidence, um, knowledge about the different theologies, how that alone could poke holes in my theories, in my belief system. That made a big difference. Just looking at uh, the time frames, looking at when certain things were introduced, when the prophet had his revelation, when, and, and looking at that in relation to when things happened for Christians. That made a very, very big difference because then I... Then I realized, for instance, that it's very difficult to fake and alter the, the Christian teachings in such a short time between when the last teachings were preached and when, you know, uh, Islam was introduced. Um, considering that there were so many different um, ways that these teachings were recorded and by so many different people and so many different... You know, there were witnesses. And the fact that I would believe in this prophet who just spoke to people that he just basically wanted people to believe him simply from having had revelations from an angel that they hadn't seen and, and just telling them that he could see this other world and how evil things were. He could, he could look into hell and that that frightened him so much uh, and that he warned his people, like things like that. But they never really saw what he had seen. They couldn't really see any miracles. It was all talk. And if this had happened in today's society, probably this person would have been proclaimed as, um, you know, someone mental. They would have said, you know what, you, you're schizophrenic. You're making this up. That's, that's what they would have said in today's society. Yet they, they believe in this, <laughs> that this actually happened. I cannot believe that I believe this. Um, also, a lot of YouTube videos that help me understand the lie. Uh, there are many Muslims who, or, you know, ex-Muslims, people who left Islam for Christianity that can give us good insight into what it was that made them leave. That is the most helpful thing, in my opinion. Um, if you are a Muslim, because you need someone who has been where you've been, who've been brainwashed to kind of remove this mentality from you. So that was really useful for me. But also, of course, the person who criticizes your faith, that they are, you know, they're not afraid of being controversial. Tell them what you think. If you think it's devil worship, you tell them that. And you tell them why. And it's very important because most Muslims do not know this very detail that um, the way that God is 
the, the picture painted of God in the Bible is not the same. It's actually the very opposite of the way that God is painted in Islam. That's a very, very big, uh, important detail that Muslims do not know of because they haven't, most of them don't know true Christianity, Christianity what it is. They just rely on hearsay. Um, and just how, just how true, you know, biblical Christianity is pretty much against the things that Islam teaches. Uh, that it's just against that Islam even exists. That's something that you have to hear to see the lie of Islam. Um, just looking at the Quran objectively, knowing all the, these things that I just mentioned to you, and not, not turning the verses about hatred and violence into something that, you know, was some telltale from, from some battle at some point. But see it for what it is. It's actually commandments written in the law book about ways that you are to treat non-believers with violence, with abuse. Um, not because of a circumstance, but because of their values, because they believe differently. And so that means that in today's society, the circumstance hasn't changed. You are you are to still behave that way. And it's not mentioned that it's supposed to be some kind of self-defense. But it's, an, it's a commandment. That's how you're supposed to treat them. Um, that made a huge difference. Uh, just the entire, entirety of the Quran, that it's so inconsistent. At some points you have peaceful verses, and at some point you have violent verses about the same situation. The more you read it, the more crazy it gets. It, the, the last parts of the book is just totally um, chaotic and uh, just evil, pure evil. I don't even understand it. It, it, it. it makes no sense and it just scares you. Uh, so, all in all, the Quran scares the, the crap out of you. That's the way it is. And that alone is a sign. Something is not right here. Um, so, just the nature of it, that it becomes darker and darker and darker. Uh, I also want to mention this detail. That, as a Quranist, I thought that... Uh, because other scriptures rely on, or other Qurans rely on the Hadiths. Um, and you can see that by seeing the, reading their footnotes. They always add footnotes at the end of, of every page related to the Hadith that's sort of connected to that Quranic verse. Now, because that's how it works, I thought, you know what, I need to buy a Quran that doesn't have footnotes. That would mean that that Quran is correct, and the other Qurans are not. But then I realized, after everything I've mentioned already, and other reasons, that footnotes or no footnotes, it's still the same thing, it's a lie. And there are no, there's no evidence and for the Quran being the word of God, and that... <laughs> The, removing the footnotes doesn't remove the violent verses. They're still there. Um, they're not even sugar-coated. They're still there, written in a more modern format. It's still against Christ's teachings. It's still against the crucifixion. Still violent, promotes abuse, demonic, scares you, guilt trips you, all of that. It's still there. It doesn't matter if footnotes or not. So no matter what book you use, it's the same message, and you realize that. I, trust me, I ordered the book without the footnotes. I ordered the clean Quran, and I, I looked at it objectively, and I saw that it was the same thing. Um, also that, you know, this misconception that the Quran it was different from the hadiths. It's not. It walks hand in hand with it. 
it has, it doesn't go as much into detail, but it does tell you to do the things that Hadith uh, explain in more detail. It really does. Uh, I didn't know this because I didn't read the Quran objectively. I looked at it assuming that the verses about violence was something historical and also um, that every time a word fight was mentioned, I looked at it as, oh, this, they don't mean actual fight with violence. No, no, no. They mean, they mean striving. They mean never giving up, being persistent. And, you know, you know how this, the, the message you learn through these Rocky movies, for instance, that is how you interpreted the verse fight. Without <laughs> taking into account that after the, ver the word fight was mentioned, there was always something about killing. And it had nothing to do with uh, some kind of spiritual fighting spirit. It was about actually fighting. I think I found like 30, 40 sentences about fighting. And I, I printed them and I made a poster about them. And I was like, this is going to be motivational. I'm going to look at this poster every day and it's going to inspire me to struggle and never give up. And you could see in every sentence, like... <laughs> There were parts of it that mentioned actual killing and things that oh, we're so Muslims. You're so delusional. You really are. I know because I was so incredibly delusional. I'm sorry for the length of this video, guys. It's gonna become 40 minutes or something like that. Um, Okay, and also that, did I mention the very important detail that nobody was there when Muhammad had the Quran revealed to him? That for all we know, he could have made it up just for something to be used in his convenience. Um, could It could also have been true rev revelation, but it's, it certainly was not from God. It was um, probably from some satanic... Uh, demonic entity, if not from Satan himself. Why else would he want to bash the authority of Christ in the Quran? Why would he want to put Christ on the same level as everything else? And, and make him some form of messenger, unnecessary, pointless messenger of God that only existed to tell people that, look, everyone, here is the book. And the book is what you're supposed to follow. Goodbye, I did my job. That, that is what they think his, his job was. That's why he died, right? That's why they wanted to kill him. Because he told them what they wanted to hear. No! It doesn't make sense. Obviously, they, they got angry with, with Jesus and they wanted to kill him and they crucified him because he pissed them off. He must have said something that pissed them off. Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just so frustrated with Islam. Um, just the way that he, you know, Mus um, Muhammad was illiterate. He couldn't read, he couldn't write. And after he was, re the angel revealed himself to him, all of a sudden he could start writing things and um, reading things. And that's something that is very typical for demonic um, hauntings. Uh, it's something very common that when you, when a demon visits you, you are, you tend to learn another language you never spoke in. You tend to be able to do something you've never been able to do. Kind of fits that description, doesn't it? Also, that Islam is so much against women. It likes to take the whole notion of being a woman and just, you know, force it uh, into like mashed potatoes. It doesn't want it to exist gone. Women have to be like men or they have to kind of totally strip themselves of what it means to be a woman and then they are loved by God. That doesn't make any sense. Why would God create a woman and not love what it means to, you know, love the actual woman for what she is? It makes no sense. Um, and again, if you look in the Bible and you look at the teachings, you see that Satan hates women, particularly women, uh, after Eve, the incident with Eve. Uh, the fall of man. I hope I'm finished soon so that I don't bore you guys. Um, <sighs> oh, 
Oh, and of course, the most important one. You're afraid of questioning Islam. You're afraid that if you are to question it, you're going to hell. Because that's what you are taught. Every time you start um, entering debates and discussions about Islam, other Muslims, they kind of walk around the house and they spread this smoke to remove evil spirits because they think that you are questioning Islam because you've been possessed by demons. Sounds to me that they're spreading evil when you are <laughs> approached with or approached by um, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. It sounds like they're trying to scare away the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I don't know, something like that, but it's definitely not getting rid of evil entities. And the whole notion that, or, you know, the, that I realized, of course, that Christianity is the very opposite of Islam. The Bible, the way it's taught, things that's being taught, the concept of God, concept of love, of Jesus, of the whole message and purpose of mankind, and of God is just totally different from Islam. So how can they be of the same God? How can God have made such a big difference in his two different scriptures? Why would he teach two different messages if it's all one and the same message? Makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, I already mentioned that prayers didn't make any sense. Um, also, that many historical events mentioned in Islam doesn't match up with how it's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, I think I have covered very important things here. Um... I think that should be enough for now. Um, sorry for the... just how long this video was. It's very hard to make these things short, but I'm going to hopefully get better at this over time, unless you guys enjoy this. You Let me know in the comment what you want um, for the other videos. Thank you for watching, and God, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating, these Muslims, you know? I know what it's like. I know because I was them. I was I was just like that and now I, when I see the lie I see what a joke it is. The whole the entire faith it's a joke. And it's a shame that you cannot say that without being worried that you're going to get killed. All right, thank you God. Uh thank you God. Of course, thank you God. Um but thank you guys for for watching and I'll see you in the next videos.